Welcome back for part two of our interview with Howard Berg, the Guinness Book speed reading record holder. If you haven't listened to the first part, you can find all of our past episodes at freemeded.org slash podcast or visit our Podbean page. As always, show notes will be provided with important links, topics of discussion, and useful summaries. Here, Mr. Berg will cover some of the memory devices he teaches, as well as touch on using emotional intelligence to decrease test-taking stress. Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. If you'd like, I can also show you how to remember. Yes. First, just briefly, uh, since we don't have to remember usually numbers and people so much, so I'm trying to think of maybe in microbiology, it'd be the microbe and the diseases would be in the chart, yes. or the cell type and the physiology, the pathology, or the uh, physiology and the mechanism of action that that's dysregulated or an error, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, nice. absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Like, I remember in 1967, I had to learn the nine attributes of a living system. Specific organization, metabolism, movement, irritability, growth, reproduction, specialization, adaptation, and control. It's 50 years ago almost. I still remember it because I learned how to learn. And you know, as a doctor, it isn't just taking the test and forgetting everything the next day. What you know is going to save people's lives. You can't afford to forget it. You actually have to remember it for the long term, not just for the exam. So if you'd like, I'll show you one strategy that will allow you to do that, which is actually a tool you can use in medical school. To increase memory? Yes, let's cover that. I'm going to give you 10 things to remember. I won't show you how. That's the control. You're a scientist. Then I'll show you how. And I want our listeners to do this with us. And in just three minutes from now, everything you couldn't remember, you will remember backwards and forwards effortlessly. And then I'll show you how to use it in your studies because it's actually a tool you can apply to medical training. I want you to remember pole, shoes, tricycle, car, glove, gun, dice, skate, cat, and bowling pins. Is it safe to say you don't know all 10 objects backwards and forwards effortlessly at this point? I hate to admit it because this is a podcast about memory and I have a technique to remember that, but I'm just too tired to remember it right now. (laughs) One of the strategies for memory, and there are many, I have a whole memory program, is take a list you know and link it to a list you're learning. The Greeks discovered this. When you think of hangers in closets, we hang things on them. Well, I know you know the numbers from 1 to 10, and they're hanging in your memory, and we can hang the 10 things you just learned on those effortlessly to remember them in just minutes. So the first thing we're going to look is the number one looks like a pole, correct? So one is pole. What's one? One pole. By the way, you want to say and do. You only remember 10% of what you read, 90% of what you say and do. That's a big tip right there. Two, how many shoes do you wear? Two shoes. What's two? Two is shoe. What's one? One is pole. Three, tricycle. How many wheels are on a tricycle? Three wheels. What's three? (laughs) Three is tricycle. Two. Two is shoe. One. One is pole. Four is car. How many tires are on a car? Four tires. What's four? Car. Two. Shoe. One. Pull. Three. Tricycle. Excellent. We're not memorizing the list. We're associating. Five is a glove. How many fingers are in a glove? Five fingers for most people. For most people. You're a doctor, so I accept. We'll, we'll go with the five for the standard. What's that? <laughs> Sounds good. So, so five is? Five is glove. Three is? Tricycle. One is? Pull. Excellent. Six gun. I live in Texas. I don't have a gun, but everyone loves guns here. Six is what? Six is gun. What's four? Car. Two. Shoe. Excellent. Seven's lucky in dice, so seven is dice. What's seven? Seven's dice. What was five? Five was glove. Three. Tricycle. One. Pole. Perfect. Rhymes work. Say eight skate. Eight skate. What's eight? Skate. Six. What do they love in Texas? Guns. 
Four. Car. Two. Shoe. You're almost done. Nine. How many lives does a cat have? Nine lives. What's nine? Nine is cat. Seven is lucky in? Seven is lucky in uh, uh, dice. That's right. Five. Five is glove. Three. Tricycle. One. Pole. Last one. Ten. How many bowling pins in an alley? Uh, when you start off, ten. Ten. So ten bowling pins. What's ten? Bowling pins. One. Pole. Two. Shoe. Three. Tricycle. Four. Car. Five. Glove. Six. Gun. Seven. Dice. Eight. Skate. Nine. Cat. Ten. And bowling pins. Perfect. Now I'm going to show you how to use this. One of the hardest things to learn are numbers. And I know there are numbers that matter, like a certain amount of injections, compressions. There's things you have to know numbers. And numbers are really abstract. Here's a way to learn anything with a number. We turn the number into a picture. And the zero, by the way, is the 10 bowling pins. Let's say I'm learning pi, just as an example, 3.14. What picture is three? Three is tricycle. One. Pole. Four. Car. Tricycle hits a pole on a car. Can you see that happening in your imagination? Mm -hmm. A tricycle hits a pole on a car. Tricycle, what number? Three. Hits a pole. One. On a car. Four. Now you know how to learn numbers in medicine. <laughs> so that, that's the uh, PEG system, correct? That's a PEG system. There are many, many different systems like that. Mm -hmm. I like to think of it as a toolbox. No two people are quite the same. What you might use in a medical program, someone else might use to learn a language, and you do something totally different. So I give people tools. But in different subjects, we have different aptitude and background and experience. Some tools will work better for you than, than others. So pick the tools that work for you and, and customize it. Here's what you can do. Find which one of these things is better for your brain. But here's something very important. Most people, I ask you, what is learning? And I said, did you study? If someone said, did you, how do you know you study? What would you say you study? How, how much time you spent? Mm -hmm. How many books? How many pages? pages? How many questions you've gone through? It's irrelevant. I did a graduate course in educational psychology in seven hours, the whole five-month course. I read the book four times. The AP test was six hours. I finished in 15 minutes. I got a B plus. I didn't get an A. I got a B plus. But I did a five-month course in seven hours and 50 minutes. Did it matter how many hours I studied? Nope. Did it matter how many pages I read? It isn't about, what it's about is do you understand the meaning and significance of what you're learning and can you use it when you need it? That's what matters. Too many people are thinking they study because of how many hours they looked at a book and didn't understand it, or how many pages they turned and didn't understand it. It isn't about reading. Reading is not learning. If it was, everyone would get an A. You could read a calculus book or an anatomy book and memorize it and still fail because you don't understand anatomy or calculus. You could study forever and, and not be able to do anything because you just know words and names and dates and things that you can't actually apply to a real life situation. It's critical thinking skills that are going to make the difference between reading a book and understanding the meaning and significance. And that seems very difficult in medical school because a lot of the material that we have to learn is, is basically studying for the exam, studying for the board exams. And you may or may not get all of the comprehension, the critical thinking while studying the material for that. So if you're not taught that, if it's not enforced enough in your educational system, your school you're going to, or certain teachers, what are some techniques that students can do to uh, at least become aware that they're not studying it for comprehension or to improve on that? Well, I go backwards. I always first look at what's on those comprehensive exams. I look at the old exams. I analyze them. It tells me the kind of thinking they're looking for, the kind of analysis they're expecting. And those are things you can learn. You know, you can learn problem solving. I know you've learned that. If you don't know what kind of problem you're trying to solve, then you're not going to be able to learn it. But if you look at the outcome, these are the old exams. Because they're standardized, they can't deviate dramatically from one year to the next, so it's no longer standardized. It's, and so there's a type of thinking, a type of analysis. You look at that, and you look at what you're reading, and you say, what matches? 
what in my book looks like the kind of material they've been asking on these exams and what looks superfluous. The same thing with the exams you're taking in classes. They may be in some schools, they keep them on file. In other cases, maybe you have friends who took the class a year ahead of you or two years ahead of you and they could show you old tests. You could certainly ask an instructor, can I see some old exams? It would help me to be better prepared. And if you do ask, more times than not, they'll give you things to do. That's one thing I'd really like to discuss, state. The emotions are so critical in medicine not just for taking exams, but for practicing. I was, I was a swimming teacher for 18 years. And one year I was swimming in a pool. I wasn't the lifeguard. It was a drowning in the other pool. All the lifeguards ran to help, except one kid stayed where I was in the adult pool. And I'm swimming, I do a mile, so I'm swimming back and forth a few times. And I noticed this old guy floating. He hasn't moved in five minutes. So I said, something's not right. The kid didn't see anything. I went over and I tapped him. He didn't move. I shook him. He didn't move. I turned him over. He was dead. He had a heart attack. I said to the young man, we've got to get him out and do CPR. We got him on the side. I said, you're going to do the breathing because you're going to, he's going to throw up and you're getting paid. I'm not. I'll do the compressions. And at that time, out of nowhere, I had to remember exactly what to do, how to do the compression. I got his pulse back. He started to, and when the ambulance came, he was alive. I couldn't afford to get nervous or frightened or disconcerned. If you're not calm and focused and clear, you won't remember anything you learn because your state changed. And so states are extremely important. That's not something they teach, but I'm going to show you how to create a state. So the state is different than emotional intelligence and emotional... Uh, it's part of talking it. About. Okay. It's part of emotional... Emotional intelligence is your ability to control yourself and interact well with others. So when something goes wrong, do you become frustrated and angry and crazy? Or do you stay in the mindset that I have to do something? When I was training the Green Berets a few months ago, I was showing them how to stay alive under fire. They're very well trained. They know exactly what to do. But you know, when someone's shooting a gun at you, it's easy to get nervous and not remember anything. <laughs> You already know what to do, but if you're in the wrong state, you won't remember anything. The state you're in when you learn is the state you need to be in when you will use knowledge. When you change states, you forget. The Russians did a study. They got people inebriated on vodka and taught them nonsense syllables. And while they were drunk, they could remember them. What do you think happened when they got sober? Couldn't remember them. What happened when they got drunk again? That they could remember again. Because they're in the same state. So you're learning in this relaxed state. If you become agitated when you're actually using it, it's going to change your state badly enough that you won't remember what you studied. I'm going to show you a simple way to fix that right now. What I'd like you to do, and it takes 90 days to form a habit, not 30 like they used to teach. Play some very relaxing music like Brahms Lullaby. It puts babies to sleep. After you hear it, gently squeeze your left thumb and say, I feel relaxed, because you do. Do that every day for 90 days. Now you're in an important exam, or you're in the hospital and something horrible happens and you really have to stay focused. You gently squeeze your left thumb and say, I feel relaxed, and what would happen? That's your stimulus response. You've created a state and a stimulus. Just like Pavla rang a bell and fed a dog, but instead of a bell, you're squeezing your left thumb and saying, I feel relaxed. Now when you're taking that test and you start, oh, look, I don't know this. I don't know this. I, instead of agitating yourself, which makes it worse, gently squeeze that left thumb and say, I feel relaxed. And you will, because it's a, it's a stimulus response that you created over 90 days. You can use that when you're in a... Uh, hospital where something terrible is happening or there's, there's a lot of traumatic things happen. Someone's spurting blood or they flatline. There's a lot of things that happen and you can't afford to get emotional, but you're a human being. You're, you're hardwired to get emotional. So that's a way to offset it. You create, so I teach people how to create condition responses for focus, for concentration, for staying alert when you're on duty for 24 or 48 hours and you're exhausted so that you can change that state instantly, just like the Green Berets, 
So you can successfully use that information you've already stored in your head and it doesn't get lost because you changed the state. Sounds like a good thing to use during testing. Absolutely. Two things I teach my students, how to get energy so if they get tired, you're taking a, 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 a medical exam, a board, it's a long test. By the end of the test, you want to kill yourself. It's so long. So this is a way to generate more energy and focus in the middle of a very stressful exam. Or if you're feeling anxious or nervous, how to calm yourself back down so you can clearly remember what you learned and use it. Uh, many pe- a good example I give to my general public is I'm a driving ed instructor. I'm not. And I teach you to drive, and I say, go get your license, you're ready. And you fail the test. Not because you don't know how to drive, because it was a test. You got nervous when they came in the car, and you couldn't remember how to drive. Happens every day, every day. What if I taught you not just how to drive, but how to relax when you take the test? Imagine now as a doctor, when you're giving your patients information they need to know, one, you teach them how to remember it so they can use it when they need it. And two, you teach them how to get in the right state of mind to use it properly. Because some of the failures they're having, it's not that you didn't give them good information, but one, they didn't remember it. And two, they were in the wrong state to use it properly. We don't teach that in medical school. But if you think about it, it would make a huge difference in in the success you would have in your practice. So you cover different reading techniques, different memory techniques, different emotional and state memory techniques. Writing, how to eliminate writer's block. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. If you do it the right way, you'll get a really good grade. Me doing it, it's a sideshow. Other people learning it and doing it, that changes lives. I'm hoping some of the people listening are going to read so many more books in their lifetime because this will make it so easy. They'll find the cure for cancer or Alzheimer's or some other disease because they got that extra chunk. No one else had time to learn, but they did because I showed them how to read and learn faster. And that's my dream. I may not be able to cure all these diseases, but you and the people listening might. And I'm hoping that I can be part of that by empowering them to learn and use information faster and better so they can make the most of the skills they're learning and make a difference. Because every decision you make is only based on what you know. And if you can learn a little more and remember it better and understand it more astutely, it's going to make you a better physician and probably help you save more lives. That's why I have hbspeedreading.com. And we guarantee the results. If they don't get what they're looking for, we'll refund the money. It's important to me that you actually do what you say and not just make promises to sell something. People in medical school, I have a solution for learning faster. The type of material you exactly need to know. I'm a biologist. I know exactly what it is you need to know. I understand anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, genetics, and those types of information, that's what I had to learn. I developed it specifically for me to learn that. So now I want to let them know I can help them do it too. That's great. I think everyone in the audience would love to be the next person to discover a great cure, make the next new technological advancement, or you know, just pass the boards for now because that's stressful. <laughs> it is stressful. It is stressful. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. You have to, if you're going to be a doctor... You have to learn how to put stress behind you. You can't afford to be stressed out. You have to be in the calmest state possible, making rational decisions based on knowledge that you've accrued. Your gut instinct, your your reptilian brain wants to freak you out, and it will, given normal conditions. But when you've learned how to condition yourself and how to create states, it no longer has to happen that way. And Suddenly, yeah, you have to take the test, but you know what? I'm ready. I know my stuff. I'm prepared. I'm confident. These are learnable skills. They just don't teach them in school. So now the audience knows to find your website, hbspeedreading.com, and we will definitely add that into the show notes so they can find them on there. Hey folks, sorry about the abrupt ending there. There are some issues with corrupted audio files, and though much of it was saved, some sections were lost. 
There's a whole other section of this conversation, which is planned to be released in a few weeks, but I really wanted to mix it up and bring forward some of the other great materials and interviews that have been conducted. Also, I want to bring you some very interesting news. If you haven't already explored this great medical study resource, go over to the ITB website right now. Their all audio cue bank is being raffled off for free through the end of February. Just go over to insidetheboards.com, scroll down past the countdown clock, and click join the contest. Guys, this is a $99 value, and there are multiple ways to win extra free tickets. You'll be able to listen to the board review questions on the go during your exercises, or even in the shower. And the all new ITB phone app is coming out soon, which will further streamline this process for your study needs. So for your chances to win this great study resource, go to insidetheboards.com or check the show notes for this episode for the links. Please stay tuned for another special episode next week or reach out to the themedicalnemonist at gmail.com, join our Facebook group, or check the show notes for all of your other contact needs. Thanks for listening and see you next week.